Anyway, this morning we're going to be back in Romans chapter 14, and, uh, and I want to start by reading 12 verses, even though we're only going to cover four verses, but um, would you stand with me? Romans 14. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another, another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and, and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Lord, thank you once again for the counsel of your word that keeps us, Lord, from judging one another and, and keeps us, Lord, in a place that uh, we could hear from you and be directed by you. And I pray that today that you'd have your way in our hearts and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can all be seated. And so the message title this morning is No Condescending Allowed. And, uh, you know, since this section has to do with the way that we treat one another and how we would respond to differences of opinion, then we must first consider what's behind the basis of our attitudes and, and the attitude we bring to the table of fellowship. Uh, you might have seen that movie, Remember the Titans. It was about a true story about a football team back in the early 70s. It was the time when I was playing football. And uh, it was, they were dealing with all the civil right stuff that was going on. And so they were having black players play with white players. They were having a problem there. And then the captain of the football team says to another leader of the football team, he says, you know, that's what I mean, man. You just have such a bad attitude. And then there's a little hesitation, and the comeback was classic. He says, he says attitude reflects leadership, captain. And I thought, now he was talking about his bad attitude matching up with the captain's bad attitude. And I started thinking about it. Well, can we say that spiritually as Christians? Attitude reflects leadership? Well, you know, not in the perfect sense, but we certainly should be able to say it in the good sense that our attitude is reflected through us because we follow Jesus Christ. And so what is it that is supporting our attitude? And so, and frankly, you know, there is much condescending in the church today. You know, and I don't necessarily mean in every congregation, but, you know, and certainly not in every heart, but in the church as a whole. You know, the church, you know, as a body 
of believers. And so when God looks at his church, he sees the many denominations, the many flavors, you know, uh, if you will. But uh, in that, it encompasses all the diversity of doctrine, doctrinal positions. And in God's view, we do not stand apart. It's sad that amongst ourselves, we stand apart. And I can understand, you know, the different churches because of the, you know, the, the tone that's set and, and you know, the, the atmosphere of worship and, and, and being able to emphasize certain areas of ministry and so forth. That's all good. But many stand in, in a part in actual fellowship. And, um, and so, you know, within the body of Christ, there, there's problem, right? There's problem Christians and misguided believers and so forth. I mean, that goes without saying. We're all, you know, in an atmosphere where nothing's perfect. We're not in a perfect world. But the Bible calls out or labels the Christians that are off base and that are compromised as carnal Christians, and carnal Christians need, obviously, to repent. They need to go in a different direction. And yet, my point is, God doesn't see them as separate from the whole body. In other words, carnal Christians are not amputees, as so often Christians will treat them. They may be cut off from fellowship. They may be in God's woodshed of discipline, but still every bit a part of the body of Christ. And so, you know, the Bible is clear that within the body there are, you know, those Christians that are more spiritual than others. Others are, are more carnal, you might say, and um, when I say spiritual, I only mean controlled less by the flesh. Because in any stretch of the imagination, even those that would say they're more spiritual are still having a problem with the flesh. So how dare we all of a sudden put us into this holier-than-thou-art place? Those that are more carnal are controlled more by the flesh. And so anyone who thinks himself spiritual, yet he looks down his nose at others in judgment, then is actually carnal himself. A condescending Christian is a carnal Christian. No getting around it. And in this section, is not dealing with carnal Christians. Rather, this section that we're going to look at is dealing with weaker Christians. And here in this section, sin isn't the issue. Rather, liberty is the issue. But to be critical and to judge your brother, to be self-righteous really qualifies you, puts you, categorizes you into a carnal Christian. And a carnal Christian is one who certainly is lacking grace. Who treats his brother like that. And keep in mind, God's blessings are given within his boundary. A brother from Southern California was visiting this last week and he gave me that one liner that I thought was fabulous. God's blessings are within God's boundaries. And it is out of bounds for us to be critical of one another from a standpoint that I'm better than you. I pray to God that that would not be your heart's attitude. And the Apostle Paul, in dealing with uh, with this, and he, he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, where he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one 
in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so we are being instructed here in this passage to receive a weaker brother. And once again, I'm not referring to sin. And yet, even when it's speaking of dealing with sin, our attitude should be one of humility. Because unless by God's grace, there go I, is the idea. And I'm far from perfect. But those who could be so condescending are automatically, their attitude is saying that I'm in a better place than you are in my relationship in grace or something like that. It's just not true. And then 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, Paul would write in I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Notice, the carnal are still in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For there, where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? That's not an exhaustive list. But it's the idea of division being carnal. And it's the idea of those who are carnal are still in Christ. And so we need to treat them as our brethren and as God leads. But We are all needing to grow up. We are all needing to be mature or maturer spiritually. We all need to partake both of milk and of meat. That's important. You know, some people are past all that. They're not past anything. You know, you need milk and meat. None of us mature past our need for milk as if to become lactose intolerant. You know, of basic principles, the ABCs of our faith. You know, what a bummer to be lactose intolerant. Why? Malts. (laughs) Shakes. You know, ice cream of any kind and milk with hot chocolate chip cookies you know it's a bummer being lactose intolerant raises issues in your physical body just like it would in your spiritual well-being it raises issues if you're intolerant of those basic things of the word of god but it's interesting If you're lactose intolerant, you could take this little pill and suddenly be able to eat these things, ice cream, and enjoy it. The issues get pushed aside. Well, you know what that little pill is spiritually? It's grace. It's God's grace. And then suddenly, all this intolerance, whatever, gets pushed aside, and now you're able to be filled with the Spirit and enjoy these things. Peter He writes in Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word so that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And then uh, the writer of Hebrews and uh, we would read in Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, where it says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to, to discern both good and evil. 
So you notice there, we don't want to partake only of milk because then you remain a baby. But milk still remains part of our spiritual diet and is absolutely necessary to nourish us so that suddenly we don't become big shots. And so again, you know, Galatians, you know, 6.1, that attitude when you're dealing with issues within the church. If our attitude is wrong, then the one that thinks himself spiritual then makes himself a candidate to be brought down by sin, to end up carnal, because they're carnal, but they think that they're spiritual. That's a scary thing. Have you ever run into one? You know, I have way too often. It's a sad thing. So in dealing with the issues and the difficulties in the church family, we must always respond in meekness, remembering that we're all sinners. We're not in a class of our own. That's where we get into problems is all of a sudden I'm in a class of my own. You realize I've been a Christian for 25 years and I study the Bible every day and, you know, and I've gotten past so much and I give this much of my time and I give this much of my resources and I haven't done this and I haven't, all of a sudden you're in a class of your own. You know, when you study like the humility of the Apostle Paul even where he would say, you know, I'm lesser than all the other apostles, but I am what I am. But it'd be by the grace of God. That'll change your whole attitude when you're dealing with problem situations. And so none of us have it all figured out. And if you think you do, you're off base already. You know? And so if you think you do, then others will have to come alongside and try to be very patient with you in grace once again. Jesus, on the eve of his crucifixion, he prayed in uh, the Gospel of John in, verse, uh, in 17, in verses 22 and 23, he says, And the glory which you gave me, praying to the Father, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and, and, and have loved them as you have loved me. And so it's clear there that Jesus is into unity. And I would only say that let's be the byproduct of Jesus' prayer. You know, let's be those that are unified and loving one another as the Father had loved Jesus. And so to participate in that, we cannot change what happens in other churches, for sure, but we can change what happens here by our attitudes and accountability to God's instruction. Let's enjoy unity where God commands the blessing. You know, a, a scripture... I refer to oftentimes as Psalm 133. It's only three verses long. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing life evermore. So it speaks of refreshment, you know, where you would otherwise be parched. And then that oil is a symbol of the Spirit of God and, and you know, coming in to the fellowship scenario and God pouring out his blessing. What a bummer not to have that. That'd be a drag. But unity is, is within the boundary of God's blessings. Are we in the boundary of God's blessings are we out out of bounds in our attitude the parameters of obedience that frees god up to bless us are you are you standing within those parameters you know children love parameters and if they don't have any parameters they just can go wild 
But you know, God has given us parameters so that he might bless us. And then within those parameters, we also feel the security and the confidence of relationship. You know, that flows through that. So how many believe that our Heavenly Father wants to bless us? <laughs> Amen. Amen, right? He wants to bless us. And, you know, in James, in James 1, uh, 17 there, you know, it tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, which whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so the Lord hasn't changed. I like how uh, Chuck Swindoll put it. Quote, Clearly our unity was on Christ's mind as he offered up his prayer. However, unity does not mean uniformity. People often confuse them. While we are called to be one, to work together, to serve together, we cannot ignore the fact that we are all different. Each one of us bears unique DNA. Furthermore, each one of us has been shaped by unique circumstances. We have different viewpoints, different opinions, different preferences, different ways of solving problems. We each come to the community of believers with our own set of convictions and prejudices, some of which we are willing to defend to the death. Nevertheless, God expects us to coexist in unity and harmony, but that has rarely occurred, unquote. He nailed it. You know, the church has been conflicted and compromised from its beginnings. Why? Because we are all imperfect sinners and selfish people. Yet we do have sterling examples of how we can respond directed by the Spirit and not our flesh. But even as we study in the New Testament, besides the Bible as a whole, we have heavy hitters that went through struggles with each other. They had to be corrected. They had to be redirected. You know, example was the Apostle Paul and Peter. Both of them apostles. Both of them spirit-filled. Both of them called to minister. Both of them leaders in the first church. But Paul had to oppose Peter for his hypocritical treatment of Gentile Christians in his attempt to please the Jews. He was a man pleaser. Well, that was certainly inappropriate. But it says in, in, sec, in uh, Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him, Paul says, to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? He was in his face, called him out on the carpet in front of everybody. This is Peter. This is Paul and Peter. And Barnabas was in the mix too. Oh my goodness. And then also, Paul was angry with Barnabas. His name meaning the son of encouragement. Barnabas was the one that put his arm around the Apostle Paul, ushered him into the assembly of the church because he was an enemy of the cross at one point, but after his conversion, it was Barnabas that came in as the son of encouragement alongside Paul, and then they went forth on their missionary journeys serving the Lord. And then all of a sudden, they had a parting of ways. And... It tells us in Acts 15, 39, where it says, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark 
and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And so they parted and they went in two different directions. And when you study the account, you really can't say that one was wrong. You can only say that they divided amongst themselves and went in two different directions to serve the Lord. Their objective remaining uh, that. Now, I say all that because as we navigate this chapter regarding Christian liberty, we learn not to be harsh, not to be critical towards ourselves because we can also be our worst enemy and also not to be harsh and critical towards others because of the instruction that is given to us right here. Very clear and very specific. We need to make the necessary changes as we're nudged by the Holy Spirit. We need to remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Also, correctly respond to one another when things come up. That's hugely important because a lot of the problems continue because we respond wrong. The re respond wrong the response is, is often worse than the issue. And so if the apostles struggled with conflict, certainly we will too. But it's interesting because the Bible tells us in Proverbs 27, 17, that there it says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And so it turns out some conflicts are beneficial. Because as the sparks fly, and when things get heated up, it could turn out good and we become much sharper for it in the sense that, you know, and I can relate. I could re relate to conflicts and I understand conflicts and iron personalities sharpening one another and the Holy Spirit using that to make me more effective for him, a sharper tool that God then can use because it gives me a, a broader understanding. But if my attitude is wrong in the midst of all that, then I missed a golden opportunity to be able to move forward, to make a greater difference. And differences of opinion can become very advantageous, especially when the objective remains correct. So like in the sense of Barnabas, in the sense of Paul then it became beneficiary. It shows up later in the scriptures that it did. Paul went on to, I mean, Barnabas went on to disciple John Mark. Paul went on to impact Titus's life and both of them became great men of God. And so we can agree to disagree and still keep glorifying Jesus. And I believe by God's grace, and I humbly submit this, by the way, that I believe that, you know, our congregation is unified. And, you know, and I'm very blessed to pastor here. But guaranteed, it is the fruit of the Word of God. Of going through the counsel of God that bears the fruit. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path so that we're able to, you know, get through these things and to follow the counsel of the Lord. And so when you look just there at verse 1, notice it says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. That word receive, the idea there is that we cover them. We take, take them by the hand and we lead them. Not that we would reject them, be divisive against them, 
but that in relationship, they would feel that safety net. They would feel that protection, even when we don't agree. And the word actually means to befriend, to be hospitable to that individual. Now, that is only uh, accomplished through the right attitude, for sure, and understanding. And it says there, receive one who is weak in the faith, feeble, sick, diseased, relating to faith. The faith, their convictions, how they relate to anything that they believe, anything in their life, what's true and right to them. You know, it's the idea that they look through the viewfinder of their convictions and that dictates to them what is acceptable behavior. It may be contrary to the word, but in their dictates of their conscience, they believe something to be true. And it's serious not to blow them off. Why is it serious? Well, if you look at Romans a few verses down to verse 23, what does it say there? It says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. So in other words, if they have a mindset regarding something being wrong, you can't just blow it off lest you cause them to sin. There's going to be more on that later, for sure. And so they're weak in the faith in that way. And then it says, but not to disputes or doubtful things. In other words, by judging and arguing against their conscience, none of us should go there. And then also over doubtful things. For, you know, doubtful things would, you know, you would think keep the main things the main things. There are certain things that are very true that we need to be firm on, but not doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. So, vegetarians eat no meat. But this wouldn't be those that do not eat meat because they don't like the texture of it. Or these wouldn't be talking about those who don't eat because maybe they feel there's health benefits to not eating. You know, like, uh, I don't see her here, but Marion. You know, Marion doesn't eat meat, but she's very strong in her faith, and she's a leader regarding that. It's not, it's not who this is describing here. But this is, would, these would be those that, that feel there's sin one way or the other. Because their conscience is telling them that. that those who, who would eat, wouldn't eat meat, like the Old Testament talks about, like pork and shellfish, because the Old Testament is saying that you don't eat it, and in their conscience, you know, for instance, raise their whole life, believing that it's wrong to eat certain things. And suddenly, they become a Christian, but they just can't shake it. So you don't suddenly try and forcefully make them, you know, go against their own conscience because then they would be sinning. And so we need to have understanding. And because of their strong convictions, and I want to use an ex example that would be uh, of Peter in chapter 10. See, he was wrestling with all this because of his Jewish upbringing. So God gives them a vision in Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 12, where it reads in, um, well, actually, I should probably back up to 
verse 11. So he's getting hungry, and then I saw heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. Then 12 in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter. Jesus said to him, and Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. And so he had to be released from his own understanding of eating these particular foods that were you know, not, they were condemned in the Old Testament. And so he was given that. And then the Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the new believers and he was writing to uh, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10, in verses 25 through 28, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. The reason he is dealing with this was because some of the animals that were sacrificed on the pagan altars would then be sold in the marketplace at a lower price and you could save money uh, if you bought this meat, which you were able to do as a believer. But for conscience sake, don't ask where it came from, what the origin of it is. Just go ahead and buy it. So this is the freedom for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go and eat whatever is set before you, ask you no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat for the sake of the one who told you. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. And so you find out this was offered to idols. Don't eat it. Not for you. You have the freedom, but for them. See, there's a reason they're saying it. So you're going to stumble them. They made the issue of it. But you see the freedom we have, but now you have to be a little bit understanding of somebody else's conscience. Not condemningly, but for their sake. It's for their benefit. And so, and then, you know, in verse 3 there, we're accountable for our actions and responses and words because look at what it says regarding despise. Let not him who eats despise him. That is to look down upon, to think less of. But we need to beware of this lest we end up in the, in the woodshed because of our attitudes. We're taking our freedom and we're flaunting it. We're looking down our nose and all of a sudden we're considering ourselves in a better position. You're going to end up in the woodshed of God. You know, why, why is that? Well, just the principle of Hebrews 12, 5 through 8, because we're his sons. It says, and have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there when a father does, whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So guess what? We've all, we've all been disciplined by the Lord one way or another. But... Don't despise him. Or, or it says, despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat, so this would be the one who does not eat the meat, judge him who eats, for God has received him. And so in either of the situations, God has received them. What right do I have to reject them? To have a problem with them. And that's the balanced word there. It's a vice or versa, flip side situation. So if the legalist, and he's a legalist if he judges, he's not a legalist if he just has an opinion just to eat vegetables, but 
but that individual is given the same boundaries as those who would have liberty. So those who would stand in liberty or those who would stand without the liberty, which would be contrary to the word, have the same boundaries to work with them. The same responsibility not to look down at others. This, because if they did, it would be the same offense to dishonor the Lord. And you know, I'll often think about this when a Christian rakes me over the coals to my response. They rake me over the coals and, and so knowing that if I respond wrongly, then I too will be in hot water. And I don't want to go there. Because it's real easy for us to all of a sudden blame shift and justify ourselves because they did this to me first. You know, they struck the first blow. So I have every right then to do them wrong. No, <laughs> you, you don't. And so, and so then that last verse, who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. And so God's able to take care of all those things that, that we might seem so caught up with. And, 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 and how somebody else chooses to serve the Lord. The meaning to judge means to condemn. And in the extreme sense, to condemn. But in the lesser sense, to raise questions or suspicion. Do you know that interferes right there in relationship? All of a sudden you have a question mark about that brother. One who, you know you know, to be a Christian, but now you start question his relationship. Beware of both are guilty of the same offense. You know, too often we can justify our, our, our own self-righteousness because we say it's only a question mark. Yet guess what? <laughs> we're ser we're, we, are, we are questioning the servant in whom Christ died for. And now we, you know... We'd be like part of a family, and you know how the pressures get when siblings gang up against another sibling? Well, you know you were adopted. And then all of a sudden, there's this tension. It raises the question. Yeah, you notice your hair is lighter, and you don't look the same as us. You're adopted. You don't look like mom and dad. You know, I say that humorously, but that's the pressures that are brought within the body of Christ because one person judges another. And to a lesser degree, even bringing the questions that strain relationship, question marks. Because you know what? Just like children can pick up on things, we can pick up on things when we're really accepted or not. And so, but God knows. And so in that place, this is important. Because this is the place you can hide out in. Just the question marks. Nothing is hidden from God. And so do you know, do you realize you come here in worship? There's that boundaries. Whether somebody's a legalist and condemning, they're outside those boundaries, so is the one with the lesser offense. And so you're outside the boundaries of the blessings of the Lord. <laughs> God knows. But it says there, the end of verse 4, God is able to do that necessary work, that servant. He's able to minister into their life so that they would keep their faith. Whereas if you dealt with things the way you want to in your carnal nature, you would cause them to walk away from their faith. And how many times you heard about that? They're so judgmental. You know, and some churches are horrible in that sense. 
you know, you even have to dress a certain way so that you meet the, you know, wearing a suit or, or whatever. And so, you know, they get so legal about things that they just strain fellowship and strain the Holy Spirit from working because they're judging somebody just even by the clothing that they would wear. And I'm just going to read one last verse here, and that verse is going to be Matthew 18, 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And so this is important. And then actually I have to read uh, one last uh, scripture. And that is in, uh, in Jude. Where it says, um, last verses of Jude where it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Who is it that is able to present you before his presence? Jesus Christ. So you're not going to be the one doing it. He's the one that's ministering carefully into the life of his children. And so, you know, think about it. Each one of us have responsibility, and I get up here and I share the word, and it goes forth to the radio, and it goes forth to who knows where. And so I pray, and I carefully deal with situations, just like when situations come up in the church. You know, I have to pray, how do I deal with this situation? And I have to do it from, from humility. And so an indication that you're way off target is when you're prideful. And so I only want to encourage you, don't let that critical spirit be amongst us. Yeah, and as, you know, new people might come to the church and they don't know better, but they can learn by our example. But if they come in here and we do nothing but be critical, then they'll also learn that bad habit as well. And, you know, we're responsible before the Lord, aren't we? And so, you know, I'm looking forward to going through. There's a lot more there, but I just kind of wanted to set the stage there when we start talking a little bit more about things that, you know, people might feel are okay that other people don't, you know, within the church body. And there's been divisions over it. You know, and I would go on record to say there's been times that I probably, you know, hit a subject too hard and wasn't as sensitive as I should have been. Um, but sometimes you wonder, you know, why we go a little slower than maybe you would think. It's only because sometimes I feel like when I make a statement, I have to make sure that I balance the things that I say rather than just move on and give people the wrong idea of what's being said. So we rightly divide the word of truth and teach the scriptures and then just pray that God would work it out in your hearts and that you would just embrace what is true. Amen? Okay, let's stand together. I heard there's roast beef sandwiches down there with uh, french fries. <laughs> but if you need prayer, please come up forward afterwards so we can pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for just loving us, Lord, and we thank you for blessing us like you have and providing for us. And I pray for our church as a whole, Lord, and I just ask that we would be those that would embrace grace and one another and work through issues in, in, in love and um, just understanding that we're not always going to agree with each other, but that we need to love one another. We need to be unified lord that you might bless us and so just move among us holy spirit we love you we thank you in jesus name amen god bless you